colleagues, alumni, friends, and, and many others. Uh, my name is Mark Ventresca. I'm on the faculty here at the University of Oxford at Said Business School. I'm also a fellow of Wolfson College. I'm very happy to welcome you to a conversation tonight, a dialogue about innovation in the 2030s, looking beyond technology. I'm gonna be joined by one of my colleagues, Daniel Armanios. We'll have a chance to uh, visit with each other in just a moment. Hi, Daniel, welcome. Uh, just to get started though, this, this session is part of the 25th anniversary of Said Business School. We're looking to the future. We have a newly uh, joining us, a new dean. Uh, we're working with colleagues around the world, with students and alumni. And this is one of many conversations looking at particular areas of research and expertise in the school to open up useful, pragmatic, and also conceptually rich questions about core ideas like innovation. Uh, I want to remind everyone, welcome to enter your comments and chat in the various social media you're on. Our team here will be harvesting those and sharing them for Daniel and me to respond to. I'd also like to ask you to put your name in and maybe your location if you're interested in doing that so we have a sense of who's asking questions and the kinds of questions. So uh, the, the plan for this evening is uh, I'm gonna ask Daniel to introduce himself and then I'll introduce myself a little more formally. We'll go into a conversation. Each of us will speak for 10 or 15 minutes laying out some issues we see from the research that we do. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of back and forth and be available for questions and, and conversation back and forth. So Daniel, again, Daniel is a, I, I've been at site as some of you know, for a long time, for 18 years. I'm in the strategy group. I do work on innovation and, and, uh, and strategy. And I'm, I'm very interested in a number of large scale industries that are converting, that they're shifting in these times of digital transformation, but also in times of renewed uh, government activity and also new kinds of consumer connectivity through the digital world. So uh, Daniel has arrived just recently. He's a distinguished colleague uh, and he's gonna introduce himself for a few minutes, tell you a little bit about the kinds of things he does, then come back and I'll make some comments and we'll go back and forth. So Daniel, over to you. Thanks, Mark, really appreciate it. And, and hello from, from Pittsburgh. Uh, currently I'm gonna be joining you all hopefully soon, uh, more permanently in person in Oxford. Um, as it says on the on the name tag, I'm the BT professor of major program management. So obviously, the first question is, what is a major program or how do I think of it? I think of major programs really as large scale initiatives. Some people use certain financial metrics to it, but I think of large scale as more conceptually as involving uh, an interdependent set of stakeholders, organizations, communities uh, working together around initiatives which for which the inputs or what goes into these projects, how long it's going to take to work with these inputs to then deliver what you hope to achieve outcomes are all kind of uncertain. And so with that perspective in mind, my work kind of looks into um, bringing in the engineering sciences as well as the organizational and social sciences to understand how these stakeholders coordinate within a major program as well as how do they coordinate between the major program and those communities that will experience, intersect, or interact with that major program. Um, my work involves a variety of different uh, thrusts. I'm a mixed methods researcher, look at qualitative and quantitative data as it applies to a range of issues such as um, the way in which the innovation system in China is, des is designed to coordinate across um, private and public sector organizations focusing on um, the organizations that are involved in those innovation systems, how certification works in the US context, as well as also physical infrastructure in a variety of contexts, such as the United States, China, um, uh, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, and elsewhere. And so with that, I'm looking forward to uh, talking uh, further on uh, further on this, on this really important topic and has really important implications on uh, major programs. Off to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Daniel. Great to, great to have that opening commentary. Uh, let me join Daniel in a little bit more background about me. Uh, I am interested in how markets form. I'm not an economist, I think, in terms of institutions and politics, uh, the importance through which in emerging new or nascent industries and nascent markets, we become very interested in the sets of rules that are contested over both by entrepreneurs and incumbent firms, and also by government regulators and other intermediaries. 
I'm interested in how we shape categories that help reduce ambiguity. And I'm also interested very much in the conventions we agree on through negotiation by fiat, by regulation, that help to solve and, and, and create the terms of exchange. Uh, and so I'm interested really in what many people see as like, like kind of social sciences of market creation, market formation. I've developed that in a couple of industries in the energy industry and digital energy services. I'm working now with a team of people here at Oxford on space governance and commerce. In other words, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but the newfound interest in commercial activity and commercial applications in outer space and also in low earth orbit. Uh, I've also done work on higher education. And what Daniel, I would like to do is bring together some insights here about innovation broadly and then specifically in some of the domains that we work in. Let me, let me start by a very quick primer on the, the, the kind of challenge that we see in the next 10 to 20 years. So a long debate has been, where does technology come from and how does technology matter? Some people argue that technology determines possibilities and determines uh, futures. Others, and I would put myself in this category, see technology as a bundle of possibilities. So keenly attentive to the importance of basic science, invention, how those inventions become technologies. More skeptical, more skeptical though, those technologies themselves act on their own. Instead, I would say, and joining many colleagues, I would say technologies are bundles of possibility. How we build social capacity around them, how we build infrastructure, the kinds of regulatory rules that get put in place, those actually shape both the trajectory of technology and their long-term impact, either for value creation or for social good or social difficulty, social bad. So I'm very interested in beginning to bring this framework into some of the conversation we're having. A second broad question, some of you will know the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in economics about 12, 14 years ago. Ostrom posed a really interesting question for us. She said, innovation is important, but innovation always happens in a context. And she said, we've been hobbled in some ways over the last couple of decades by only having two governance solutions. On one hand, either create private property and then create a market in the traditional sense of creating a market or give authority to a state or other regulator and allow them to, to uh, function. I think Ostrom's argument based on a lot of interesting research on what she and many others call uh, common goods, common resource pools, looked at things like fisheries and timber and other collectively used uh, uh, resources. And she was interested in saying, what role do communities play? What are the role for an alternative to the state or the market in beginning to use and support and steward those scarce resources over time? I think that conversation comes right into the questions around innovation by doing two things, it reminds us there is no unstructured space. Technology doesn't meet emptiness. It meets some set of legacy agreements about how to uh, govern and steward those innovations. And also some questions around who gets to make a decision in that, who gets to sit at the table. So I see Austrian's work on the commons as directly relevant to the work of our colleagues at the World Economic Forum who have postulated this idea of a fourth industrial revolution. What they mean by that, as you may know, is that the, the, the flourishing of many remarkable technologies today, basic technologies like genetic modification, like artificial intelligence, these are platform technologies that have the potential to redefine not only everyday life, but our, our, our nature as humans. Uh, the forum, the fourth industrial revolution, many debates on that. It's not a settled situation. But the key insight there, I think, is a point that the colleagues at the, at the World Economic Forum have made. They say these innovations are interesting. These technologies are interesting because they have the possibility to meld together digital, biological, and physical systems. And it's that feature that they say more than any one of them really forces us to ask questions about ethics on one hand, who should have a voice at the table, who should be making these decisions, and broadly governance. What are the institutions we have? So one of the one of the claims I'd like to make out of this is that for a long time, 
we, and by we, I mean policymakers, researchers, and everyday people have had a very positive view of technology. Technology solves endemic problems. Technology provides solutions to long-term issues. And, you know, we can look at many kinds of data to say the world is, in the aggregate, a healthier, longer-lived place than it was in some earlier periods of time. And we often attribute that to technological innovation. The challenge there is a lot of that framing of technological innovation makes implicit or makes invisible all the work of social and cultural governance, all the work of infrastructure, of complementary assets that give those technologies particular animation or particular impact. And so I'm very interested in this idea of as we go forward, we want to dramatically remember and reimagine and reconnect these questions of complementary assets and governance with core technology. So in a sense, the title for today, Innovation in the 2030s Beyond Technology, is both an embrace of the power and importance of new technologies, but also a claim that we've come to a place in our history and our societies where we need to have a much more active imagination about how technologies change the world and then build them in ways and bring them into conversation around governance and so forth that tries to design value and improvements to them. This is a debatable position and we can have that debate as we go on and in your questions. Uh, the, the core idea here though is, I'll, I'll reference another set of ideas. For a long time, uh, a, a, a guy named Joseph Schumpeter gave us a vocabulary for understanding innovation. Importantly and interestingly, he said, too often we precede the word innovation with the word technology. And Schumpeter a long time ago said, innovation involves not only technologies, but also governance arrangements, supply chains, organizational forms, many different elements that together animate and guide why technology matters. So on one hand, I wanna re-embrace that idea that, uh, that, uh, that innovation is not reducible to technology. And this becomes important in some of the cases that Daniel and I were talking about. Uh, I also wanna encourage us to think about those are not solvable debates. Governing technology is always difficult. Uh, if you intervene too early, you distract or you distort the basic science. If you intervene later, you run into problems of not being able to redirect or contain the, the, uh, the technologies. So I'm asking us to do two things to begin to decouple the idea of innovation from technology per se, and also to begin to think about, speculate, think through how we can begin to uh, uh, progress this idea of the governing of the commons, treating uh, new technologies and their impacts, whether it's, again, as I said, artificial intelligence, applications in renewable energy, uh, new uh, directions in uh, uh, human health, we want to treat each of those as domains where there is absolutely powerful and valuable technological advance, but we want to also build in a commitment and institutional arrangements that open up those possible impacts for the de debate, speculation, and possibly intervention. So in a, in a sense, that's where I'd like to go. I want to talk in a few minutes a little bit about the work we're doing in space commerce and governance. But for, new, for now, Daniel, let me over to you to have a little bit more of your views on the work you're doing. No, th thanks, Mark. And I, I really like where you ended in terms of the um, distinctions between innovation and technology, because that's where I'm going to start, actually. So I think one of the challenges and what Mark has been mentioning is one of the challenges we're having is that we do inextricably link technology and innovation. So just to, for the sake of our dialogue, let me just reference where I'm coming from. So when I think of technology, um, I'm thinking of machines or equipments that apply scientific knowledge, that instantiate scientific knowledge. So for example, this computer, it's taking ideas of semiconductors, electricity, et cetera, and allowing me to do something with it. So the computer would be a technology, for example. Now I distinguish that from innovation, which conceptually to me is just simply introducing something new or making change to something established. Now, by just the very definition, new is relative, new vis-a-vis -vis what? And so there's gonna be context, there's gonna be different kinds of perception of what new is, but just for the sake of argument here, we can think of technology as a machine or equipment that applies scientific knowledge and in innovation is something changing the established or introducing something new. 
Now, why do I make this distinction? So for example, if we're talking about technology but not innovation, we can go back to the computer again. So I'm using this technology. Have I done necessarily something new with it yet or reconnected something new? Not necessarily, right? Even now, if we think provocatively, maybe the first instantiation of the iPhone was a technology that was also innovative. But if you look at the version, the versions we have now, it is a technology that's applying scientific knowledge. Is it necessarily new? That can be debated, right? So that's the way we could think of it. At the same time, we could think of innovation that's actually novel, that doesn't necessarily presuppose at least scientific knowledge. It may require experiential or indigenous knowledge, but maybe different. So one example I'd like to give on that, on that regard is the Zebelin community in Egypt. So Zebelin, literally in, in Arabic, Zebel is the garbage people. And they're responsible for recycling much of Cairo's trash. Okay. And so what they do is they actually have an entirely community-based organization process by which some people pick up the trash, some people are processing it in sorting, ho sorting houses, and then it actually goes to different community members that specialize in different forms of trash, whether it's aluminum, plastics, etc. They even have a trash school that actually innovates and that actually works on recycling trash. Um, they don't really use much technologies in terms of equipment, they're using much of it via their labor. Interestingly enough, in terms of the recycling rates, at least of plastic, they actually have the best recycling rates in the world, better than any country. It's about 85% they're able to gain in terms of recycling from plastics, as opposed to, I think the best case I've seen now is in Korea and Germany around um, 70, 80% is last check I've had. And in this case, in my opinion, this is highly innovative. It's reconceiving new community processes around trash, how to, how to get the trash, how to process it. But it's not necessarily involving technology in the historical traditions we think of technology. And so I think to think of the future beyond, it's kind of, in some ways, it's like a back to the future moment where we need to think about innovations as it's separated from technology. Now, in terms of, um, now, why that's useful and important is then we can start thinking of innovation more as a tool and not necessarily an outcome. And as with any tool, it can be used for good and bad. So let's use an example of a, you know, a reasonably modern corporate innovation, if you look at the history of corporations, would be something as simple as the multi-unit multi, multi -unit business, right? Div div dividing products into di diversified firms, dividing their products into different components. And Alfred Chandler, the great business historian, argued this was one of the key innovations that allowed for businesses to modernize, which was simply, you know, being able to break up your products into units. And so he mentions the railroad industry, meat packing, and how it was able to introduce refrigeration through that model. Now, that's a quote unquote, perhaps good innovation. However, we also know some of the most effective self-contained or multi-unit organizations would be terrorist organizations. So for example, Al-Qaeda and others, they have a general mission that doesn't, you know, in terms of inciting disruption, and their cells can essentially operate autonomously on that, on that program. And they, this is what makes them extremely hard to detect. Also extremely effective. It's not necessarily, I think, something we would wish for anybody, right? So once you start unpacking innovation as a tool, you can start seeing that innovation when it's used for good and when it's used for harm. Now, in terms of now, we've talked about innovation technology, let's think briefly about 2030 and beyond. So what do I see as the trend in terms of what innovation is gonna look like? I think especially what I see in terms of major programs, in terms of these large scale initiatives we discussed uh, more recently, I think of them as more distributed, they're more decentralized, they're more about situating it in specific contexts, and it's often about right sizing. It's not taking one project and scaling it for more people, it's building thousands of little projects that each can work for their small community in town, et cetera. And we can think of some examples of this. You can look at microgrids in terms of where microgrids are being distributed in different parts of the world. You can look at cloud computing, edge computing, which is much more about distributed forms of innovation. I mean, information. In fact, you can even think of those kind of major programs as not in the ground, but literally through the air, right? Very little of a cloud computing system is physical, right? It's the broadband, the servers, but really what you benefit from cloud computing is the ability to lump together, combine data into data lakes, et cetera, and use that information. And so if that's the world we're looking at, which I think is more distributed, more decentralized, the final point I wanna bring up is then how do we consider innovation? What are the kind of key questions and how do we go about handling that kind of distributed decentralized innovation? The first question to me is where do you build resilience? 
And this to me is a notion of surveying or mapping out your project or program or innovation as a system and seeing who's linked to what. As a very salient example, we know right now the, the Russian invasion in the Ukraine. Ukraine right now is the fourth largest exporter of iron ore. Iron ore, for those you may not know, is a key input to steel. And so if you now map up your innovate, you map your innovation system, let's say you're working on, you know, uh, iPhone electronics, et cetera, you can think it needs a, a huge amount of steel. It turns out one of the major exporters of that steel is South Korea or importers is South Korea. So right away, I'm going to know if there's disruption in Ukraine, which is the fourth largest producer of iron ore, that's going to disrupt my operations likely in South Korea, Japan, China, the big importers of that ore. So then you need to be able to build resilience. How do you, do you need to find alternative uh, ch supply channels? Do you need to use substitute technology such as scrap steel in the interim to kind of handle that? That's going to be a key question. So where do you build resilience? Secondly is how do we help reimagine the possible, right? So this is where I think of things like collaborative technologies or technology that helps you experiment, which is what I call scaffolding. So an example there, let's just take climate change. By 2050, we have to hit net zero emissions. 2030, 2035, we need to have emissions. Most major programs, are, uh, are their lifespan is, or their, their completion rate is five, 10, 15 years. So really the programs that we're building now to develop our future innovations have to have emissions now. However, it's very difficult to realize what climate is going to do 15 years from now in my project. How is flooding going to affect my building? How is flooding or, or, or changes in temperature going to affect my cooling of my server system? That's going to be increasingly difficult because we know also with climate, and as warming occurs, the temperature, the rain, all these other environmental fluctuations also become more unpredictable. So that opens up an entire new arena of technologies that could help us maybe experiment, such as augmented reality, where we could overlay what certain models would predict in 15 years on our current projects or uh, digital twins, which are virtual instantiations of the physical, right? So this is this is kind of you know one aspect. And then the final one is who has, who has been missing in this process historically? Increasingly with uh, the social movements that are, avail uh, that are out there in terms of inclusivity and need for equity in terms of incorporating or ensuring that everyone who could participate productively can do so, we have an issue that our innovations are asymmetrically distributed. So how are we going to be able to develop innovations that not just advance new ideas, but can sense or detect or include those who have historically been marginalized? And this is where we can think of, you know, uh, trailing edge technologies like infrastructure, roads, broadband, uh, roads, um, gas lines, electricity, et cetera, that have been asymmetrically distributed. Perhaps if we flip it on its head and use those networks to detect where people are marginalized, that can help us further target further um, isolate or further use limited resources to help those who have been previously excluded in the process and also build, build action plans that incorporate them when these systems are together. And so what I would like to leave you with when we're thinking about innovation, just to summarize here, is that innovation, I think, is more decentralized, more distributed. It's about right-sizing multiple projects as opposed to scaling one big project. And with that, that requires three questions, where to build resilience, how to help reimagine the possible that's very difficult and unpredictable. And thirdly, who has been missing historically in the process? And that leads to what I call the three S's, surveying, systems mapping of the project, the collaborative technologies you build to help with that experimentation, which I call scaffolding. And then finally, how do we better detect who has been marginalized historically, which I call sensing. And with that, I will go back to you, Mark. Daniel, extremely interesting, extremely helpful. We have some overlap and some points of difference. I think your 3S framework, sensing, scaffolding, and uh, sorry, surveying, scaffolding, and sensing is a really interesting and important way to begin to recognize this. I'm going to suggest uh, in, with some cases that I know as well, that in some sense, these are really about the politics of innovation. They're about helping us go beyond a purely technocratic view of technology and bring us back into the same points you made, who's there, whose voice is heard, who's part of the conversation. Uh, I'm also gonna agree with you about the decentralized nature of both contemporary experiments and large scale uh, initiatives. We are leaving an era, probably a long era, 100 years, where centralized, large scale, high capacity, high capital intensive uh, uh, technologies across many industries were common. 
that represented in some ways the coming to fruition of an idea of scale that's maybe outdated at this point. It was an idea of whether it was in paper uh, creation, you know, creating paper uh, uh, or creating steel, sort of regardless of the industry, the interest was in large scale, concentrated uh, capital intensive activities. A number of challengers over the last 30 years have reminded us in this, your sense of imagining the possible that there are many alternatives to that, mini mills in steel, the kind of revolution in paper production that use more and more recycled pulp in the creation of paper. We could go down many industries in the energy industries, what you mentioned about microgrids and other decentralized worlds. One of the interesting trends is away from large scale, centralized, focused core technologies. That I think raises two kinds of questions. One, your point about resilience, I'm on board with. It helps us to think about how do we make uh, both individual uh, technologies and also the wrappers around them more resilient. I think this, you mentioned the aggression in Ukraine. I think we could think about the pandemic and the efforts now to build back or build back better. Uh, I think we could look at a number of, of recent both conflicts in the world as well as natural disasters. And I'm using that word natural cautiously. Uh, but we could think of many ways that we've been reminded of two things, how fragile are the ecosystems that we live in, both as uh, environmental ecosystems, but also supply chains and so forth. We're also reminded of the, the vividness, which for many of us around the world, we now understand the complex interdependencies in every zone of human activity, whether it's delivering fresh uh, vegetables and fruits, whether it's getting uh, uh, vaccines and other medicine to populations that are outside of the main population centers, we could have a long list. I think these have all reminded us of a new kind of awareness of interdependence and what you said, how do we build resilient systems? I think that's partly a technological activity. It's also a political activity. And one of the, uh, my sense of where we're going over the next 10, 20 years is going to be a renewal of connection between state actors and other intermediaries, that is a proliferation of regulatory activities to help build and rebuild markets to have different kinds of purpose. My colleague here, our colleague here at Oxford, Colin Mayer, has written extensively in recent years about corporate purpose and also about a, a core insight for him was for a long time, corporations were valued and rewarded for literally creating externalities in the jargon of economists for polluting, right? His point now is corporations need to become good at being at solving for externalities. It's a very different shift. Another colleague here at Oxford, Eric Beinhacker, says for a long time we thought of corporations as accumulators of capital uh, and very consistent with your points, Daniel, Eric would now say, no, no, we need to think about corporations as experimental test beds that because of their scale and wealth and capacity can actually generate and test possible solutions. So we're moving into a conversation that says, let's not feel we have to accept whatever technology comes along. Let's instead begin to be creative and also innovative. Let's think about long-term experiments, test beds that help us understand the impact of artificial intelligence in different settings, that help us understand the impacts of 3D manufacturing, 3D manufacturing, for example, in space. Right? So we're, we're moving into a conversation from many perspectives across both academics and policymakers that's increasingly interested in saying, let's think about organizations and institutions that become, uh, that, that become uh, uh, testing or uh, experimentally minded. That'll be a big shift both in public policy and how we think about public sector provisioning. It'll also be a shift in corporate mandates and I think this is one of the directions we're going in. As you, as I think we all probably know, there are periods of more or less intensive uh, uh, government activity. We're entering into an era after the initial uh, interesting innovations in things like platform economies in the 90s and the early 2000s. We're entering another era of focused, attentive government activity. This is government activity that's not only trying to fix broken markets, in the words of our colleague uh, at UCL, Mariana Matsukato, but it's actually regulatory attention that builds new markets, that uses these ideas of decentralization 
and resilience to create markets that work better. Uh, same, the, the language of this idea of markets that work better comes from Al Roth, who got the Nobel a few years ago for talking about how do we design markets to, to really help us find ends that we want, ends that benefit wider society. Now, right, right away, some of us are going to say, well, that's, that's, un, that's in, unacceptable. We want to have free markets. We want to have no kind of constraint imposed by the market. I guess I'm going to offer a, a modest suggestion. We've probably never had free markets. We've always had markets that are organized by rules of the game, created by one or another group of interests. We're now in a time when we're thinking about innovation needs to move from being build the technology and use it to saying let's experiment with many technologies and then let's couple those technologies with useful interesting complementary assets with new forms of accountability with new forms of governance to really get to what you're talking about daniel resilience distributed nature and then some kind of ethics of inclusion uh, I'd like to say a couple minutes, if okay with you, Dan, I'd like to say a couple minutes. We've done some work here on uh, space commerce. Again, a lot of interest in the commercial applications in space. A lot of uh, funding is flowing to ventures of all kinds, grappling with everything from how to use more effectively data coming from satellites to space debris. These are linked, of course. Space debris, if you're not following this conversation, is all of the leftovers, it's human pollution in low Earth orbit, all the leftovers of launching all kinds of rockets and satellites and other activities. In the last year, there have been a couple of notorious cases where, for example, the Russian state blew up an outdated satellite, blowing it into thousands of small pieces of metal, which then flow around the globe at thousands of kilometers per hour, right? So space debris is this idea that our same exploration of space and this recent commercial engagement in space is also being accompanied by pollution in the old sense, in this case, pieces of rockets and, and satellites. The argument here is at some point, this is something called the, uh, the Kepler hypothesis, at some point, the volume of debris will make space unnavigable. We won't be able to safely launch uh, or, or any kind of, uh, 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 rockets or satellites with people on board or other human life, other kinds of life. This is a this is where we come back to questions around governance and the importance, the imperative to reimagine, to reimagine how we govern these collective spaces, these commons. Uh, here at Oxford, we're doing some work on space debris, really following the work of many colleagues. There are probably right now five core technologies being tested, being tried out, that have the potential to help us uh, begin to resolve the problems of, of space debris. None of them are foolproof. Each of them creates other kinds of difficulties, as is often the case with new technology. But space debris is one of those issues that may not be vivid for many of us, but in fact, it's dramatically shaping how we'll be able to access space for the things we care about, GPS systems, satellites of all kinds, the data we're getting that shape uh, sustainable development goals. And so in a sense, space debris becomes a code word or a summary for saying why we both need to value the technology, but also imagine innovation that goes beyond the technology and really touches on these questions of governance. Uh, a couple of interesting things to think about. Historically, for 50 or 60 years, there were a few large national space agencies, NASA, ESA, uh, the, the Roscovos in, in, the, in the former Soviet Union. Today, in the last 10 years, probably 25 countries have created national space agencies, not to launch long-term missions into the cosmos, not to explore Mars. That's still the province of a few countries. But instead, these are countries around the globe who have created national space agencies to imagine how to use satellite data to address uh, challenge on the Earth climate issues, migration issues, traffic issues, agriculture. In other words, they're, they're looking to satellite data to address uh, some version of the sustainable development goals. This is technology not for its own sake. It's the possibility of technology coupled with human goals, human aims, aimed to help humans thrive in an increasingly complicated world.
Uh, so again, Daniel, I think in that sense, we're in some alignment and your language of distributed, resilient, and so forth is incredibly powerful. For me, that becomes this question around a politics, who's involved in creating the guidelines and the framework and the infrastructure that lets us both explore, but also experiment and harness those technologies for human goals. D Daniel, back over to you for a minute. Yeah, sure. And then and then we'll take questions. But I, I was going to say, um, you know, you're absolutely right, Mark, in the following sense in that, um, you know, I'm I'm my approach is more managing the ramifications or the outcomes of the politics. I'm not I'm definitely not engaging in the really important and very powerful interrogation of those politics and what we should do, how to rethink that kind of approach. And in fact, um, the kind of work I do is why I enjoy working with anthropologists and others is because they're constantly inviting me to interrogate. And based on that interrogation, I'm thinking about what does that mean in terms of the methods of how to manage that? And so often the politics very much to your, to your point, especially around the sensing point, is really taking the outcome of those politics. So my argument is that when infrastructure gets asymmetrically distributed, it's definitely a political process that skews that towards those who are in power versus those who are powerless. And I do have some work that's characterized that, but really my interest is thinking about if we're thinking about innovation in a world where there's already been that politicization, how do we rethink how we approach innovation by acknowledging that there is these asymmetries? I think you brought up two other points that I really think is important to just touch on briefly. One is rethinking our business models. So an interesting uh, occurrence that happened literally yesterday is the EU has decided that there's going to only be one kind of unified charging system. So this is the USB-C system. And one of obviously one of the big uh, companies lobbied against it was Apple saying that it would make their lighting, uh, lighting uh, charging system obsolete, that it would make billions of uh, you know, products obsolete. And one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is that for many companies, the business model is still one of obsolescence. You want the technology to be outdated so that you buy something else. But if you're going to start having, and, and as a result of that, how do I make sure that it's exclusively mine, which is how do I build standards that are unique to my company? And, and there's these kind of fights between a standard that is unique to the company versus more collective based standards. And I think as governments start getting involved in standardizing that process, there's going to be some interesting things of how we rethink how do we develop value and revenue? A lot of companies, especially in, on the physical side, are thinking through obsolescence. But that obsolescence and why the government is introducing these things is they're worried to exactly the point Mark said is the pollution. The amount of e-waste, the amount of landfilling around that has become too much so that that can no longer be kind of tolerated. And so standardization in the, the theory of the government, especially the European Union, is ways to reduce that waste. So I think rethinking the business models around this is going to be crucial. And then secondly, which is the large scale experimentation that Mark brought up, is rethinking our financial models. One of the things, in my opinion, that's hindering us from doing really effective large scale experimentation is the, the mindset of early stage investors in this space. So if you look at the, the models coming out of Silicon Valley, et cetera, they have this what is known as a hypothesis testing, what I call a hypothesis testing mindset, which is I want you to run a test and experiment to show me that this could be useful, and as a result, then I fund it. The challenge with that model is that to be able to come up with a hypothesis test that is cheap enough that would still allow someone to invite investments really restricts the kind of things you can do. So this is there's a big reason, in my opinion, why in Silicon Valley you see a lot of IT, a lot of app development, a lot of kind of technologies that can be tested at a small scale and then realize big returns later. But if you're looking for larger scale, especially social impact, as well as technological impacts that are in more capital intensive industries, these tests are in the order of billions of dollars, you know, hundreds of millions. For example, if I want to test a new drug for biotech, to go through all the FDA processes, all the clinical trials, that's going to take millions of dollars to create a test. The same thing for clean energy. And so we need to rethink financial models. And there's some colleagues of ours, Mark, uh, uh, of Mark and I, such as Tim Jenkinson, Pinar Oscan, that are rethinking what is the financial technologies, what is the alternative conceptions of technology, uh, of, of finance, that can help us allow for these bigger, bigger kind of large scale experimentation that's necessary to make the bigger dents we need to address some of our grand challenges. Because right now, the financial models really heavily predicate on early stage VC angel financing, of which 
the kind of financing they can do is at much smaller scales and over much smaller kinds of experiments. And so I think this kind of approach of rethinking financial models, rethinking the business models, and also rethinking the politics around this and how that's shifting are all things that I think um, are definitely crucial. And my, to your exact point, Mark, my, my work is focused more on how do I manage the ramifications of that as a manager or as a person inv invested in the technology? While I think it's just as important, which is the things I see you doing, which is interrogating those processes in and of themselves. And then when those outcomes change, that's going to feed into something something different, I think. So I, I really appreciate yep. and take to earnest yep. what you're saying. Yeah, Daniel, thank you. Let me just underscore what you just said, which I think is incredibly important. And I think colleagues, you know, I see in the chat, many colleagues are our alumni and current students. How fortunate to see so many familiar names and so many familiar insights and familiar questions. Um, but let me underscore what you just said. What you just said is in the 2030s, the real innovations are not gonna be in the technology. They're gonna be in financial architecture. They're gonna be in business models. They're gonna be in the capacity to do large scale uh, sampling and experimentation. I think that's a beautiful summary of this whole session that we're mindful of technology, but we're realizing technology is always wrapped in a set of potentials and wrapped in a set of contexts. And you've just said really clearly, the real action, the real innovations that are gonna matter are gonna open up emerging new technologies to larger scale systematic testing, to longer term application. I mean, I think that's incredibly interesting. And I wanna just call that out as a really powerful, succinct insight at the gist of this. I think one of the things, Daniel, I didn't wanna do was come off as being against technology. We both think that technology is really important. We think it's enabling. What Daniel, what you just said, Daniel, is saying these are the areas to invest in. These are the issues to pursue. If you're interested in innovation, let's think about how we unwrap modern corporations. Let's think about how we are uh, really thinking now about longer term experiments. How do you mobilize an ecosystem of corporations, ventures, entrepreneurs, incumbents of many kinds, along with regulators to begin to open up those longer term experimenting both the time, the tolerance for the time frame involved, and also the capacity to do it. I think that's a genuinely interesting idea. I see a couple of questions. Let me invite people to keep putting questions in. Let me um, let me uh, speak to one from Saul Betmead from uh, from I believe uh, Antibes. I don't remember exactly where you are in France, but but Saul has a question. How should we think about the TMO framework? How can that capture the three S's? This is an insider question for colleagues who come through some of our uh, graduate courses in innovation strategy. Uh, quickly, I'll just say this, Saul, I'm happy to talk to you offline. I think that Daniel's view of the three S's, sensing, scaffolding, uh, sorry, surveying, scaffolding, and sensing is a set of activities you do within each of the TMO. So TMO is an acronym for saying, we think value creation and progress happens at the intersection of emerging technologies, how they meet and sh are shaped by emerging markets, new nascent markets that are unsettled and full of uh, activity and by capabilities, organizational capabilities in the old strategy sense. So in, in those classes, we talk about TMO as being, you have to pay attention to both the, the dynamics of technology, you have to understand how markets are forming around those technologies and reciprocally shaping them and how firms and agencies of all kinds may have to build new kinds of capabilities to take part in that. You know, the, the current example of this is platforms and how platforms make firms rethink the core capabilities they have. That is moving how to manage complex sets of relationships in the world and the governance that goes with that. Uh, the technologies could be many. They could be uh, fundamental artifacts in the way that Daniel talked about them. They could also be new kinds of resource pools. And the markets there are really building on what I said earlier. Markets are systems of rules shaped by and, and informed by categories, sorry, excuse me, that reduce ambiguity and also conventions that help us establish uh, value and, and the exchange value of activities. So Saul, I'd say you could bring that same conversation as saying surveying, you know, what's what's in place here now? What's, uh, what's available? Who's involved at this point? You could bring it into the question on scaffolding. Daniel's idea of scaffolding, I think, is a really powerful idea that says, how do you begin to create capacity, infrastructure, 
bridging to go from today to tomorrow? How do you get from where we are now to new ways of doing things, experimenting and so forth? And then that, that, last, that last idea of sensing is having a consciousness, who's included, who's available, who's not included. Uh, I think that's. I think each of those can be a part of the TMO analysis. They also do say. I know many of people have commented on. They bring back agency directly into TMO. They bring back who's who, who's affected by these issues, and that's a question. I think Daniel has underscored. I think it's increasingly a question. The little bit of in, uh, engagement I have with major programs when I talk to our students and our alumni, one of the biggest issues they face is more and more debates about local access local control, local voice in these large scale distributed uh, programs of activity. So I think we're in a time again when the, I'll call it broadly, the little p politics of who has voice, who's invisible, who's visible, incredibly important. I think those trends are gonna uh, grow more and more strong. I also think Julian Corridge, another colleague of ours, another alumni is asking uh, both Daniel and me, the power, we, we mentioned the power of decentralized experimentation and the value of resilience in the context of AI, he says, bigger still seems to be better. China's leading in AI applications because it, access to it has access to massive data. US is leading in AI research because it's outspending everyone. Europe represents diversity and decentralization. Uh, what are your views on the complementary assets that Europe, I think it, the question runs out there, but Daniel, do you wanna say a few minutes about that AI as a technology mm -hmm. in China where it's, extraordinarily uh, been able to harvest data, whether through voluntary or coercive means, funding in the US and find the European approach. Mm -hmm. No, it's interesting. I mean, just to give background for those, uh, Julian's touching on things, just to give a background in terms of um, what's going on here is that we know from artificial intelligence that the kind of where the, the, the work is going, at least technologically, is things around neural networks, deep reinforcement learning that require huge amounts of data. And so the two things that seem to really drive the advancement of AI is a lot of computing power and a big population of which China has both. And so that's where kind of um, Julian is introducing it. And, and as a result, there's been a kind of, I think, and you see this similarly in terms of, uh, money, etc. I think there's been two interesting trends that have kind of tried to bring in more humanization to the process. The first is trying to think of ways to develop algorithms that do not predicate on having large data. Can you take like a subset of the data and still get reasonable accuracy compared to larger scale? This is in fact a big tension that happened recently in Google, which is the notion that, you know, you can continue getting more and more data to get that ever smaller increase in performance, but at what cost? What cost to the environment? What cost to the um, to, to money, et cetera? And so there's been some interesting approaches to try to think, can you develop parsimonious AI models that use less data? We see this very interestingly in the cryptocurrency space. So if you look at the, the, the conventional Bitcoin approach, it's just to, it's to build these algorithms that mine um, that mine the currency and they require ever complex more algorithms. There's other kinds of coinage coming out that's trying to see how can I do that with just my single laptop computer. And so that's one trend. The other trend is how do we incorporate the bias that comes for these training data, right? So one is not just the, the size of the training data, but what is the composition of it? So for example, there's been some a huge amount of work around image recognition that a lot of the training data sets come from a single gender orientation, single ethnicity, et cetera, and that's biasing these algorithms. What I'm also including more recently in my own work is the notion that even the physical attributes have distinction. So instead of just even the training data itself, is that if the physical space is skewed and all the algorithm is sees the current infrastructure and assumes even distribution, you're going to get similar bias. And so we've actually been thinking about um, to, to that front, as well as a class of algorithms looking at this, is how do you penalize these algorithms to not overfit on prior data because of these biases? And so to summarize very quickly, Julian, I think there's two trends. One is how do you run subset analyses that are more parsimonious, more energy efficient, that can still replicate the performance of the larger data? And I think the second one is developing... Um, algorithms that penalize overfit to data with the recognition that there is bias either in the training data that's used or even the physical space in which these planning systems are, are dealt with. Specifically in the latter one, it's you know smart city, smart transportation, smart light kind of systems. So hopefully that gives you some sense of where I think at least 
operationally, there's an increased hope of, of bringing in the human uh, uh, voice to that, um, let alone even trying to recognize the gap between the users of AI as well as those who produce it and maybe developing model cards or other kinds of scaffolding that can help explain to users where they're, where the AI can be useful, where it can't, almost like nutrition facts for labels for, for bread and such. There's some that are talking about this with what they call model cards. Um, so hopefully that's helpful in terms of where I think the trend is going on that on that space. That's great. Daniel, thank you. Another one for you. Saul says, a functional one for Daniel. Where can we find out more about your three S's framework? Yeah, I'm in the in the process of writing it. So you're getting you're stay tuned. It's getting there. Um where we're in fact that's um I'm hoping to write this up soon. So please email me and reach out and I'll be able to to share more on that. I have kind of slides and stuff that's that, but I'm still um uh, writing it up as we speak. <laughs> yeah, great. A quick comment here on on some of what Daniel's up to. Some of you know he's joined the faculty recently. He's working in this area of major programs. He's working with a number of our colleagues who've been long term, uh, uh, long term engaged in that conversation on these decentralized, large, complex systems. I think Daniel is working with the existing colleagues. He's also bringing in these ideas that come from the three S's. So literally what you're hearing today is probably one of the first times, Daniel, that you've shared this framework. It's early days, it's very powerful. I think it's gonna become something that we all come to know and use. In some ways, for the reasons we mentioned a few minutes ago, first you pay attention to what's in this space, surveying, then you think about scaffolding, how do you get from today to tomorrow? And then you think about these questions around sensing, that is a, a particular commitment to understanding which voices are less present or silent, and how do we begin to uh, move that ratio? This is the broad question of inclusion that I think we're all interested in these days. How do we make uh, broadly innovation more useful and also more equitable in its impacts? Uh, another, another question from Muhammad in India, and Daniel, I'm happy to go with you on this. What kind of innovation will affect ocean energy systems? So I know you've done a lot of work on water policy. I don't know how much you know about ocean per se, but happy to hear you. And I'm also happy to start if you'd like. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to mention a couple of things. Um, yeah. I would say around um, a couple of, I think in terms of classifying the whole ecosystem, I think that's a longer conversation, but I think there's a couple of interesting um, kind of trends that I think are kind of cool. Um, one is related to energy and one is more around kind of the, the fact that the ocean is having to carry a lot of the byproducts of our innovation. But let's just start with energy. I think um, there's a couple of interesting um, trends around offshoring. So there's some there's some new ideas of fl floating small nuclear reactors. Interestingly enough, who's the cutting edge of this right now are the Russians. So this is going to be interesting to see what happens in terms of the geopolitics around this. The second is offshore wind and so forth. In both cases, there's still the kind of prevailing issues around renewables is the distribution system and the transmission, I think is one of the issues. But one I wanna bring up that I think is not related directly to energy, but is an interesting tangential aspect is some really big large scale initiatives trying to deal with waste, ocean waste and pollution. One of the challenges with oceans is because of the current dynamics, they all get comp they all kind of coalesce around certain kinds of you know, currents, which I call the, the conveyor belts converge. of oceans. Exactly. And there's some really interesting initiatives to try to build big nets to kind of grab the, that kind of material and reproduce it. Interestingly enough, and I think it has really interesting parallel analogies to the issues of the space. space debris. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's, so I think you're seeing a lot of um, attention around innovation around the byproducts of our historic innovation. How do we address the, the byproducts of relics of innovation past, if you will? Um, I think there's a couple of interesting frontiers there. Great, super helpful, Daniel. Let me add to that, I'll, I'll just make the point you made also. I think that uh, Daniel's right, and uh, Mohammed in saying, let's think about some specific issues. Uh, the energy issues broadly, as he said, are about transmission and distribution. Uh, I really like this idea that there are kind of convergences of waste in the ocean. It's exactly the same uh, in space debris. I think some of the technologies that are being talked about imaginatively are similar to those in space debris. So, you know, an interesting comment I draw out from this last couple of minutes, we think about innovation in the 2030s. I'll again, echo what Daniel said and add to it. Daniel just said, 
those innovations are going to be learning to think in systemic ways about the byproducts of earlier technologies, earlier industrial eras. I think that's right. I'd extend that to say there's a very interesting debate going on around how do you build markets for the leftovers of renewable energy of solar panels, for example. What do we do with old solar panels? These are whole emerging kinds of market systems that are being experimented with right now. Daniel opened today by talking about the Zabayin in Cairo, who are a community of, of uh, people who have deep expertise in recycling, don't use mechanical technologies, but use complex human and social organization to return extraordinarily effective recycling. Again, consonant with our theme today, we may want to begin to think about how deep knowledge, deep insight, long-term collective knowledge becomes the resource to propel innovation forward. Again, I'll say this is the insight from Eleanor Ostrom around governance. Uh, Ostrom's insight was we rely on small human communities where norms are visible and available. We rely on people working together, agreeing, disagreeing, having ways to express their interests and their identities. That's what allows us to build durable stewardship of commons resources. I think you're hearing on both what both Daniel and I are saying, a renewed interest in deep knowledge collectively held that makes possible kinds of organizing that importantly discipline and channel the potential in technologies. I'm seeing a, a, a lot of questions here, Daniel. Let me share. Uh, uh, if I may, if I may please, interject, yeah, Mark, so, so I saw yeah. some interesting things from Osman. He had some yep. interesting ideas about drone technology as well as inclusivity. I think what's going to be interesting as we start thinking about decentralized, and I think it's touching on some others, around decentralized distributed knowledge is whether um, it will even have us rethink inequality and inclusion across different space. So what I mean by this, not just not just by width, but by like height. So for example, with drones, if you see some of the interesting technologies coming out of this, like Zipline, others that are now refining payloads and being able to go from point A to point B, even without infrastructure, taking also into account that there's a lot of motion in drones around actually having people run their own drone to go from point A to point B. The FAA is, there's some are saying as early as 2024, they're gonna certify drones to go in uh, individual. Are we gonna start seeing an inequality of those who can only stay on the ground versus those who can only go in the air at, some, at certain levels? I think it's gonna be really interesting as we rethink the inclusion issues because now the inclusion equity issues are not just gonna have a dimension of the typical orthogonal dimensions, gender, race, et cetera, but also it's gonna be even having specific height. And if you think of even space to that regard, who are the ones that are able to go and venture into space right now? The, the ones that are right, driving it in the private sector, SpaceX, um, Blue Origin, others, or sorry, Origin and others and Amazon, et cetera, are those with huge amounts of resources. And so are we gonna start seeing inequality across atmospheric levels even? Um, I think it's something to consider and something we should be kind of aware of. And I think um, it's gonna rethink also the kinds of innovations that will we'll address that. So it, as we address inequality on the ground, are we then reopening inequality above the ground, if you will? Yeah, yep, great. Daniel, thank you so much. It's been amazing. I think we need to wrap up in the next minute or two. Let me just say one closing comment in response to Gergely's question, Gergely from uh, Budapest. Uh, and then maybe, Daniel, you have a minute as well. So just really quickly, I want to suggest what we've tried to outline for you today is a, a view of innovation that isn't dependent on technology, but makes use of technology in new ways that serve human well-being. We've talked a bit about kind of governance. We've talked a bit about experiments. We've talked a bit about scaffolding. We've, uh, with Daniel's help, we've heard a number of really compelling contemporary examples, which are the future but they're already available today. Uh, there, I think there's value there in thinking about how much of today is already about the future and how we begin to assemble and focus today. Uh, Gergely, to your question, I think growing centralization, I think is problematic for innovation in lots of ways. A lot of innovation comes from idiosyncrasy, from outliers, from seeing something different. More and more centralization makes it harder and harder to notice in Daniel's terms to, to survey those anomalies which often are the source of new ideas. Daniel, over to you for a last minute of comment. Yeah, just a final kind of takeaway that, and this touches on um, one of the questions about whether decentralization will lead to 
faster innovation, as well as I think Tiana's point, forgive me if I've said your name wrong, about whether this kind of resilience is making us question where uh, kind of prevailing innovation models. I think the takeaway for me is where you seek to find the answer, if it's too grounded in current innovation systems, we're gonna miss out where things are happening in the future. I think we need to be more creative of where and how we seek data. Because data, if, if the inputs that are going to drive these innovations are going to be knowledge, are going to be data, are going to be resources. And if they're unevenly distributed, we're going to have to go to the places at the tail of that distribution, which means novel methodological approaches, novel ways to gather data for those who historically haven't been. And actually, in some places, this re reinforces paradigms of technology that often the periphery brings in disruptive innovations that no one ever anticipated. And so perhaps final, final takeaway, perhaps where the periphery is now is shifting and changing beyond just the technologies, but the communities and societies and organizational kind of coalitions that will be interjected into this system. Daniel, a great ending. I want to thank everyone for joining Daniel and me. We have a lot of people online. Appreciate that. Please look for the next iteration of the 25th anniversary series, The Future of Business from Said Business School. And please be in touch with Daniel and or me. We welcome you follow up on your comments. We're both easy to find on you know social media, uh, through email at Said Business School. And again, great thanks to the range of questions that came through. I will look forward to seeing you in another, another conversation. Thank you everyone very much. Thank you. Bye, bye, Daniel.